I think most people that I know who are very funny, people who are involved in the comedy scene, realized very early on that they had that funny bone. Were mm-hmm. you much younger when you found your funny bone? Were you older? When did you realize, and th- this could have been before you even found your drag persona. W- did you find your funny Bob before your, your drag Bob? Well, I found myself funny when I was, pro- when I was like, I think when I, once I got into theater in high school and I was like, I would do these plays and I would make choices that people would laugh at. Then I remember being in like 11th grade and this, and this one girl looked at me and said, I think you're the funniest person I know. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm the funniest person you know. That's so interesting. <laughs> and then someone else would say, you're the funniest person I know. And then after a while I was like, I guess I am funny. I love, and I think the best part of it, and, and you can tell me because part of the, the joy of performing at a venue like Caroline's is you have an audience. You have an audience there that that already gives you that feedback. And it's very much the same with drag, I can imagine, because you perform for an audience. Like, how much of it is that, like, feeding off the energy of people that are surrounding you? Well, I've adjusted quickly. Um, For me, the bulk of what that was for me was feeding off the energy of people. But now I've learned to tap into that energy while being on the internet somehow. Like, even though I can't see you, I've learned to get the energy from comments. I've learned to get the energy from emojis. I've learned to get the energy from, from, from those kinds of things. Because I also realized too that like, when I was not doing online performances, I didn't realize how many people in the world actually don't have an opportunity to, do, to come to performances and are now seeing more drag than they've ever seen because we're all online. What would you say is the biggest difference between a drag audience and a stand-up comedy audience? Well, uh, point of reference is the main difference. The point of reference. For example, if I get on stage in front of an all-drag audience, especially if they're a drag race audience, and I go, come on, season six, let's get in the whole crowd will yell, sickening. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas if I get on stage in front of a bunch of people who aren't familiar with that context, they'll be like, "What what are you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I kind of love that you gave a shout out to the straight people in your audience at the Caroline's special. How is that like performing to a non queer audience? And, and does it is there any anxiety associated with any of that performance? Not, not for me. You know, a lot of the people who um, come to drag shows nowadays, especially RuPaul's Drag Race drag shows, aren't they don't all necessarily identify as queer. There's lots of uh, cisgender straight women, and they bring their partners, their families, their husbands, their kids, mm-hmm. depending on whether or not the show is kid friendly, to these shows. So not everyone who comes to a RuPaul's Drag Race show, because it right now, but there's a difference between a RuPaul's Drag Race audience and a drag audience. They are yes, there not is. the same. They are not the same thing. I, I, I spent the first you know, seven to eight years of my career performing for drag audiences. And in the past, like, five years have been performing for RuPaul's Drag Race audiences. Mm-hmm. I, I love that there's been, uh, like, a lot of people, especially those who are fans of Drag Race, uh, have now immediately turned to both you and Peppermint for a lot of guidance during these really uncertain times with what, what's happening. And yeah. I think that's why it made sense that the two of you were in charge of these Black queer town halls. Um, because you really are prominent figures within this community that people will want to listen to, and we know that you have something to say. So if you could talk a little bit about um, kind of what went into that and, and making sure that even during Pride that we talk about this very important issue of elevating Black voices. So Peppermint and I were having these conversations on pretty much a nightly basis. Peppermint, I've known Peppermint for probably 10 years, but Pep and I got really close during Nubia. So we did the Nubia tour, which is me, BB, Shea kool Monique Hart, and Peppermint. And then me and Pep, we just have, we have so much in common. We are really silly, goofy, a little bit irreverent. And we like, we like goofing off. Well, while BB Zaharbonet is being really serious, we like to goof off in the corner. <laughs> um, and we're always laughing, having fun. So do, throughout the process of, of, of becoming closer during Nubia, her and I just started talking on the phone and we were just talking about all the issues going on about COVID. And then as the Black Lives Matter movement got a research and we started talking about that. And then we were like, well, we should turn these into, we should record these conversations because they actually could be helpful to people. Yeah. Um, so then we started recording them. And then one day I was looking at Obama's town hall 
And I said to myself, I want to do one. I want I want one because it felt nice to have one from what from a black perspective. Like mm-hmm. the president of the Obama Foundation is black. He had a young black man speaking, and then Obama spoke. And then I remember thinking to myself, like, oh my God, how much extra would it feel to me if they were all queer? If they were all queer, like, oh my goodness, I would feel so seen, so heard, and like my experience, I would relate so much more. And I, during, in the, right after George Floyd's death, I was really affected really deeply. I was crying a lot and listening to like black music to uplift me and Negro spirituals to uplift me. And I was looking for a rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing that spoke to me that moment. And then I remember thinking to myself, I need to hear a queer person sing. I need to hear a queer body singing this song. So then we were able to, through the funding from um, sponsors and from uh, p- public donations, able to uh, commission Alex Newell to sing Let's Every Voice and Sing, which is now my favorite rendition because the song, I, we, I understand it on a deep personal level when Alex Newell sings it. You had a chance to chat with uh, Dr. The- Angela Davis. I knew is that what you were about to say. I guess it is. Before you even got to it, I was like, "Can you believe I'm talking to Dr. Angela Davis?" It was so wild, so insane, and also the fact that she's like hearing that iconic voice and the way she speaks against <laughs> racism and colonialism. And, and I was like, oh my God, I'm listening to this voice, looking at this woman, this is bananas. She went from America's most wanted to one of America's most beloved treasures. Imagine, I don't mean like kind of, I mean, she was literally on America's most wanted list. Yeah. And now she's one of the most beloved treasures we have in this country. 